Um, thanks for coming. Thanks to the organizer for uh, organizers uh, for letting us talk today about um, a few things um, that I'm going to present. Um, the, the general topic of, of the presentation is about code publication and peer review as part of the life cycle of publishing a paper. Um, because you know, I work for Nature, for Springer Nature. Um, within Springer Nature, I'm involved in uh, the Nature journals, and I wanted to take the opportunity to make this a bit more of a discussion around what we've been doing with code publication and peer reviewed. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a, a trial, a specific trial that we've run for a year and where we have some initial results on that I think are quite interesting around code publication and peer review and hopefully you know, touch briefly on recognition and incentives and then hopefully have a, a discussion because I know many in the audience are interested in this topic, have more experience perhaps than us in this topic and I'd be very happy to take feedback and ideas back with me. Should I use this? There. Great, so I'll give an outline here of what I'm going to cover in the talk so that you're not lost. Um, the first thing, I'll outline a little bit the problem around code publication and peer review and sort of what's guiding one of the solutions we're proposing here, uh, the best practices and guiding principles that have sort of guide us through this process. As I said, we, we have tested uh, this idea of using new technological solutions to facilitate code peer review and publication recently, and we partnered with um, one of the platforms uh, that does um, um, code publication, which is Code Ocean. Uh, I think Pierre is in the audience too, so he might have more um, answers to any technical questions you have on the platforms. Um, I'll touch briefly on incentives and then I'll open the floor for discussion. So what problem are we trying to solve around code publication and peer review? Um, again, I think I'll touch on this very briefly. I think everyone is attuned to this. But um, the number of research um, papers, but also just research projects that make use or use uh, or develop new code is increasing. Uh, data sets are larger and we, we're using code to analyze um, the data and give us responses, but also there's a lot of sort of um, interest in computation as a tool to do research. Um, we're also aware that today's scientific discovery process involves all these digital resources, and it's important that we capture that in how we publish the research. Um, one of our sort of long-standing ideas is that if, a, if code is central to the main claims made in the paper, uh, we need to properly document it, evaluate it, and make it permanently accessible uh, as part of the, the, the publication. And obviously, we want to be sort of sensitive to this changing landscape of research and how outputs are changing as a consequence and, and have a home for that in the paper. So, so some of our guiding principles with the publication of code in specifically are that we need uh, proper documentation in the paper. The code needs to be sufficiently documented to enable others to check and reuse it. Uh, this includes very sort of technical information on the dependencies, the operating systems, the technical requirements, the licenses, the terms of use, all these kinds of things need to be there somewhere. Um, in our view, code needs to be peer reviewed uh, when it is central to the paper. This means uh, a couple of things. Um, obviously, there's a technical review, a verification that the code actually runs and that it's executable, that someone can follow the instructions and make it work on their computer. But in our view, there's also a, a second aspect to peer review, which is how um, the, the code, the actual performance of the code sits alongside the claims made in the paper. Uh, that's really um, the realm of a, of a peer reviewer, of an expert in that field that can assess both things. And then there's the sharing and recognition part that comes at the end. So basically, that code needs to be provided as part of the paper. Um, it should be cited and properly uh, identified with a DOI, so it's permanently accessible, uh, recognized for its own value, etc. So with those principles in mind, what have we been doing? And you know, when I say we, it's, it's nature research um, and, and in, some, in some cases also Springer Nature as a whole. So um, I'm going to talk about this case study of what we've done at the Nature Journals and start a little bit from the beginning, um, what we've been doing sort of 10 years back. Uh, and a lot of this may not be known um, 
but um, for about now five, six years, since 2013, 14, um, we started mandating, along with many other publishers and initiatives, uh, the, the specific, a specific section in the paper where you can find information about the code, if there is code in the paper that's developed, that's new. So not all papers would have this. Uh, so this is along uh, the lines of the data availability statement that you're sort of all familiar with. Um, our, our our papers would have a specific section called a code availability statement when there is new code. And in that section, an author would be encouraged to tell us where that code can be found and if any restrictions and access um, to detail why and where and what those conditions are. So that's done across the board and it's a fairly sort of straightforward process. But um, what has been sort of a bit more um, unknown is that for, for many years now, for, you know, it started in 2007 in one of our journals, Nature Methods, um, some journals have taken an additional step to actually peer review the code. Uh, so the reason this started back then was because uh, Nature Methods published, uh, obviously, as the name implies, methods papers, papers that are supposed to um, advance research by reporting new methodology that researchers, other researchers will take and, and use to do more research. Uh, so that ethos for the journal really sort of guided the idea that when the method was a computational tool, software paper, um, that software uh, needed to be tested by someone in, during the peer review process to make sure at the time we're publishing the method, people can actually use it. Um, if, if the method is that software, then you know, it, it opened up the possibility to actually ask the author to submit to us the source code and the instructions, the readme file, etc., and a, a, a toy data set to run the code on, and to ask reviewers to actually go through the process of installing and running and telling us if it works. So we started doing that, and we call it the traditional peer review of code model at the Nature Journals. And you know, I, 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 I think just by explaining to you what it is, you can already glimpse how labor intensive this is. Um, the good news is that at the Nature Journals, we have in-house editors that work full time and that sort of are championing the, the, the papers through peer review. So, so they're taking care of that source code being there or asking for it or chasing for it. Uh, and then they're providing it to the reviewers, asking the reviewers to check in, getting the feedback, and then ensuring the final paper has you know, a suitable code. Um, as I was just saying, this is time consuming particularly uh, for the peer reviewers. Um, the reviewers are also um, you know, following a very high demand in peer review in that they have to actually find the code, acquire the hardware, you know, set up the environment, anything that's needed, and run um, the, the code, and then tell us how that code performs vis-a-vis -vis the, the claims made in the paper. So this is a quite cumbersome process. That said, um, and I don't have the slide here, I took it away to, to make sure I was quite streamlined. Um, this has been a quite successful um, practice, if you will, with uh, it, with a, within our editorial practices. I say that because I've been an editor doing this many years ago at the journal, and, and it was very, very common to get comments from the reviewers about the actual code not running or not performing well or, or improvements to the code. So it certainly surfaced things during peer review that made the final code, in my view, uh, much better and that sort of enabled users to use it uh, in the final paper. Um, because it's cumbersome, we have taken um, some steps along the way. We've developed checklists, as the little cartoon was showing uh, right before. We've developed a checklist that helps authors uh, navigate the process of submitting code to us. Uh, and we've also created some guidelines uh, that are online um, about sort of what to expect from that peer review of code that we're doing at the Nature Journals. But we wanted um, to take things a little bit to uh, a, you know, a better level uh, by, by using technology. And that's when we um, started this trial that I'll talk about now um, to use container platforms for peer review and publication of code. So this was the, the original blog that we published to describe the trial um, now over a year ago. Um, and you can read a bit more about what we set out to do in that blog post. But I'll, I'll tell you um, the gist of it and give you a glimpse of the results that we've now accumulated over the year or so of doing this, um, this trial. So the idea of the trial is really to use container platforms to um, help 
mostly editors and particularly reviewers through the peer review process of code, all those different steps that I've told you, and to enhance the publication of the final, final paper through this, through this mechanism is, uh, itself. So what is this container platform? And I'm, I'm showing here CodeOcean's interface. Uh, there's now a couple of these platforms available, um, but CodeOcean was the one we partnered with for this trial. Now, you know, and again, Pierre is in the audience, so he might be able to answer any questions specifically about the, pl the platform. But, you know, very briefly, um, um, the container sort of environment allows uh, a researcher to input the code, the source code, and uh, as well as the data that the code runs into. And in a Docker-based, I think CodeOcean is based on Docker, most of them are. In a Docker-based environment, you allow um, cloud-based running of the code on that data and reproducing the results um, in the cloud. So this gives you, this is an example from an actual paper we published and what it looks like. You have basically uh, a view of the, the elements that went into that code, the source codes, the readme file, etc., the data, and then you're actually able to run it and execute it and see the, the results. Any user can access this. This is an open platform and you can also download it and input your own values and then sort of see how the code behaves. So it's an interactive platform and, uh, and it allows also for reproducibility and transparency. When, these, when, this, uh, when this platform um, sort of came across um, uh, our knowledge, we, we became immediately interested in using it for peer review. And you can all probably guess why. Uh, because peer review of code, um, the old way, the, the way we're doing it, the traditional way is so cumbersome, we thought um, it would be great to be able to um, provide this to the reviewer um, as, uh, as a means to sort of access all these critical elements in the paper, give them the opportunity to evaluate the code this way, and, and eventually also publish it. So what we did was um, a, a small trial with uh, three nature journals, Nature Methods, Nature Biotechnology, and Nature Machine Intelligence, um, who all published quite a lot of um, code-heavy papers. Um, and Code Ocean, and uh, this was an author opt-in uh, voluntary trial. So at the time the paper's going out to review, our editors are asking the authors um, if they're interested in using this functionality to submit the code and, and peer review the code. Um, we explained that this is an alternative. Alternatively, they have to submit the code the old way through you know, our, our usual checklist mechanism, uh, but this does require them to do a bit more extra work before peer review. The reviewers are then, so, so we work uh, to set up this capsule. I'll talk about it in the next slide. Maybe I'll use the next slide to, to walk through this. Um, the author basically, when they accept, they'll work with um, the staff at CodeOcean or a container to sort of build this tool, build the, the container for their code and their, and their paper. Um, and once that's all done, um, what we will get as an editor is a copy of that, a, a private copy that we are going to use for peer review. So the peer reviewer will have access to a private version um, of that code where they can um, you know, um, visualize it and play around with it. Um, all the actual peer review process, the comments about the code as well as the paper will happen through our traditional manuscript tracking system. Uh, but essentially the difference to the schema I pro provided earlier is that the reviewer um, is, is immediately, ex you know, has immediate access to all of that in one place. Um, so back one, again, just the trial, we would give uh, the reviewers not only the private access, but some hours of computing time um, to play around with. This is also important because um, otherwise we're, we're relying on their own sort of um, servers to, to evaluate code for us. Um, and then the readers would also eventually get access to the code via, uh, via a link to the platform as one of the mechanisms. The, the, the capsule, the, the code uh, in the container would get a DOI and uh, be cited from the paper. So that was the outline of, of the actual trial that we run. And I'm going to just walk you through what we learned and what we tracked um, and then discuss um, more ideas. So, so these are some of the the performance indicators that we were looking to to learn from. So, obviously, we're very interested about author opt-in. How many authors are keen to do this? Um, 
we are interested in effects, qualitative effects on, of, on peer review, both in, t in terms of the timeliness of peer review as well as the quality of peer review. Um, and we also were interested in user metrics, how many reviewers are actually you know, using the functionality and how many readers are actually clicking on these things. So some of the results. Um, the great thing is that this is, this is what our code availability statement of one of the papers would look like in the published paper. I just wanted to show you so you know what, what we're talking about. Um, the, the great thing for us is that this is really giving us a gateway to ensure papers provide open, verified, properly documented and cited code, which is exactly what we're after, right? Uh, but what, what it comes down to is, is what you see down there in one example. Um, the code is provided via the capsule um, which shows that sort of interactive interface in a link with a DOI and it's cited in a reference. That's great. On the other hand, code lives sort of a very fast life of evolution and we do like to encourage citation as well or mention of a folder via GitHub or other repositories where, you know, code gets updated continuously. So a reader could also get the most up-to-date version. Uh, but the code of record, if you will, the code that is, you know, um, the one that provided the results reported in the paper for reproducibility is very important that it lives in a DOI um, provided uh, entity. So more results. Uh, we've, you know, we're, we're low volume publishers, uh, as you know, at the Nature family. So, so about, you know, now close to 90 papers have gone through the trial um, and we've published a good um, couple tens of them in, in, uh, in our journals. The author opt-in has been quite pleasing. Uh, now, we're, as I said, we, we are asking authors for a little bit more work before their paper goes out to review, and so we weren't expecting a huge um, uproar in taking this up, but about 50%, 54% across all the journals of authors opt-in, so, so they're, they're willing to sort of do the extra effort to build uh, the, ca the, the, the container uh, so that we can use it for peer review. There's a bit of variation across the different communities. Importantly, um, the reviewers are also using this technology quite readily. So that, that was uh, a very important metric we wanted to make sure. So any of those private links that, that get sent to the reviewers gets uh, viewed an average time of, uh, an, average, an average number of times uh, around 34 um, times. So, um, so that's giving us a sense that there is a response to that and, and there is an I interaction with that platform for peer review. About half of those reviewers actually sign in and duplicate the capsule, which is required for them to run it um, or upload their own data or whatever. Um, and on average, those reviewers would run the code about 1.3 times. And then we have metrics also on the visibility or the use of the, of the code container platforms on the CodeOcean side associated with our, with our um, papers. So, on the, on the flip side, there's a lot of authors that say no too, right? And, and we're very interested in understanding why, because this might not be ever a one-size-fits-all solution, clearly, and nor that we want it to be. But we were very interested in, in understanding what the authors that are saying no are saying. So we captured all of that in a manual way. And, uh, and these are sort of a bit rough numbers uh, of us curating all those emails and, and communications we have. But a lot of our authors, obviously, are very savvy computer uh, that submit to these journals, so they're they're coming to us already feeling what they what they have is is pretty user friendly, um, and and that's that that's great. Um, about twenty three percent of authors, uh, you know, es estimate that uh, the platform itself won't be suitable for their case. And um, to be fair, we haven't followed up with with these authors to say to to verify if indeed that was the case or not. We we take their word for it and 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 put them as a no. And then some, some authors are definitely worried about delays to publication. Uh, creating these, these containers can take between two days or a day to several weeks, depending on the state of the code, depending on the, the savviness of the researcher, and depending on a lot of other factors. Obviously, some take a lot of time to run, and, and these, these are uh, platforms that are verified. Uh, so they are tested in, in, in the container uh, environment by CodeOcean so that so we know by the time they get to the reviewer they've been run at least once and the results are indeed um, obtained from those from from the data. 
In terms of qualitative uh, feedback that we've gotten, again, we've collected uh, everything we can, but we've received a lot of uh, support for the initiative, obviously. There's a authors telling us that they do support the initiative in terms of how it supports reproducibility and open science, as well as reviewers. Now that's a bit it from me on this trial, and you can read more about it uh, because we've 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 written um, quite a number of of uh, editorials at the journals about the initiatives, as well as um, um, a, a blog post recently last week uh, explaining these results. Um, so if you're if you're interested in this, I'll take questions afterwards or, or talk at the coffee. Um, at the coffee hour. Um, I, ha I don't have a slide on next steps, so I'll just mention that we are continuing this trial going forward. We're going to expand it to a few more journals to evaluate uh, things like discipline-specific um, uh, engagement with the platform um, and, and scaling to uh, other publishing models like um, journals that have editorial advisory boards, etc. On the incentives and recognition step, just very briefly, because obviously we've talked about in the in the other sessions about badging, and that's the obvious obvious thing. We we should do more to recognize these efforts from researchers that are that are putting forward their um, their code, their data, and their best practice. Um, front and center. Now, we as publishers have a role to take, and obviously that's what we have been doing here um, in, in really making sure if there is code, we must ask for it and we must peer review it. Uh, but, but there's clearly a need, uh, I think, to, to recognize that and to surface that in the paper. So we've not done anything on this yet. Um, we've not sort of added any badges or anything specific to those papers yet. Uh, we're, we're part of um, an ESO working group that's developing some badge recommendations, as some of you in the audience are too, for computational and computing science. So we will take what's, what's recommended from that community of publishers, key stakeholders, and probably try to implement it um, across our journals going forward. But I'll, I'll definitely take any um, feedback and information on, on best, best way to think about recognition, surfacing the value, et cetera, of all this, as, we, as we've not sort of given that as much thought. Um, so with that, I think I'm on time. I will uh, just thank everyone. This is obviously not my project. This is very much the project led by um, a couple of people at Springer Nature, myself and Samia uh, Swaminathan, who's the, our head of editorial policy, and, and of course the actual editors of the journals who are doing the hard work. So thanks. Ah, okay. Hi, Erica. Thanks for, for that wonderful talk. I had a couple of quick questions about um, how you were doing your pilot. Um, the first one was to understand whether uh, the reviewers were reviewing just the code that had been offered by the authors of the paper or also other code that was supplied and was required for uh, understanding the results. And the second one, which I'm, I'm really interested in knowing whether you collected data on, is did you find that the, the sort of pilot way of doing it with Code Ocean meant the reviewers took more or less time over their reviews? Yeah, great question. So let me, let me see if I understand your first question. So, so basically what we're trying to do here is, is compile all the, the code associated with the paper into normally one, con one containerized platform that's provided to the reviewers. And the reviewers are, assess are assessing that visa, you know, against the claims made in the paper, the story told, etc., and telling us both how the software performs, but we know it performs because the actual platform already verifies that the code runs. Uh, so it's more around does the, the code actually uh, provide sort of the advance in terms of scientific um, advancement as well as sort of the methodological advance that is being uh, presented in the paper. Now, we, we do have papers that report um, comparisons of code, right? Uh, so take, you know, I have um, software that does 
you know, an analysis of, you know, gene sequencing data, and it does so better than this other software, and, and there's a side-by-side -side comparison. We've published a lot of those papers in the past, and normally, um, you know, we, we would need to provide the code for both, right, in that kind of paper. We, I don't think we have any of those in this trial, uh, but in that instance, uh, it would be one where I would imagine we would have a, a container for each of those elements, and the reviewer would be asked to sort of compare them side-by-side. And then um, to your question about sort of the time in the review, very good question, very hard for us to get the data on that because unfortunately uh, we have to sort of manually extract the, all, the, all the data um, uh, that is from our big repository of papers in that journal to, to categorize the ones that went through the trial. So we don't have an automated way to know from our tracking system, okay, these are the papers that went through the trial that had a container with them. So, so it's a manual process, let's say, to get the data. Um, we've not seen any particularly big trends uh, in what we've we've analyzed. Our hope was that it would speed up peer review, of course, because and we, we say that very upfront to the in the letters to our authors and reviewers that the hope is, although there's a bit of initial time to build the container, uh, the reviewer just has to click and see and have examined. They don't have to do all the installation. Um, so that's the hope, but we don't have any hard data yet. So two, uh, sorry, over here. Um, two quick questions, I think. One is in both the traditional model and the new model, how many software reviewers are there per article? It, it kind of looked like you were hinting at one, but I wasn't quite sure. No, um, uh, and, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then the second question is, I think following up a little bit with what Neil was saying, what, what happens when there's a paper that's written and the author of that paper has nothing to do with the software? They're just using somebody else's software to do new science. Right. Um, great. So, so the first question. Um, um, sorry, I'm blanking now. I'm thinking about the second question. <laughs> yeah. So, so the number of reviewers is up to the editor. Normally, so, so there's two two answers to the question. Uh, it depends on the paper. If the paper is primarily a computational paper, we would have probably three reviewers that are all computationally savvy. Uh, you want to cover with the reviewers all aspects of the work. If a paper is, the, the software is one part, but then they're applying it to a number of things, then you'd have some reviewers just cover the, perhaps the, the, you know, the results and not so much the computation. So it varies. The good news is that with using a container platform, there's nothing stopping us from sending that to all reviewers, even if you're not computationally savvy. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the peer review with container platforms will be sent to everyone, uh, both a computational scientist that's there to evaluate the code as well as a scientist that's covering more of the results they can also examine that and evaluate sort of uh, you know the backbone of it if they wish um, and then your second question sorry can you remind me nothing to do with the author. Of the paper. Yeah, so we're really restricting this to when the, the code, the paper reports new code. If you're using a software that's already there, then that original site, you know, description citation should have covered that. Now, obviously, there's a gray area here, right? Sometimes, um, sometimes code is, to a method paper, a code uh, is, is presented in a preprint. So it has not been peer reviewed. So what do we do then? So then we think about this quite quite a lot and we would probably then treat that as an unpublished piece of code and, and request it and peer review it ourselves. Uh, but if, it, if, if the code has been published and peer reviewed and has a DOI somewhere, then we're, we're not going to submit it to this because we assume it's already been vetted. Uh, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, so I had one question. If you tell reviewers, uh, don't worry, we've actually already got this set up and running so that you can see it running in this capsule, does that not actually take away part of the important peer review insofar as they should be knowing that the documentation is sufficient to set everything up? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's true. I mean, some people will, will, will actually feel that it has more impact if, if we're giving them all the resources to, for anyone to install it. Now, in the container, you also should have all the elements. So that's how we started the proposition with Code Ocean. We went to them with our checklist and said, look, here's what we do. We ask authors to submit to us all these documents, give us all this information, and then we send this to a reviewer. Is your, is your container going to be 
able to capture all this as well. So we're making sure that container is also encompasses all the documentation that we would have provided otherwise, if, I see, if you see what I mean. So there will still be a readme file, there will still be instructions for installing that and all the kinds of things that we that, that anyone can can you know need if they're going to sort of um, take the source code, install it their own way, um, etc. Um, I think I sort of feel like in that case, maybe unless someone actually tries running it, just because it's present doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it works. But I see your point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And that's